Hi again, everybody. Um, it's Katie again from Alveston Park Friends. Welcome to the, oh my goodness, fourth day of Alveston Park Friends Star Party 2021. Um, you lot were scaring me. I had a few minutes to go and still no people had arrived, but we've got 17 of you now. Hopefully we'll get a few more. And of course there'll be people watching on our live streams to Facebook and YouTube too. So hopefully they are working. If you've come here for the first time, just take a little bit of time to find your way around. Over on the right hand side, you'll find a chat function. You may have um, something that says say something nice so we'll just say something nice um at the bottom of your screen you should also have ask a question okay so if you've got a particular question and i can see one in there at the moment are there any planned missions to explore the caves on mars well we'll try and look at that a little bit later but thank you for the question carl you can um ask Anything you like in there, no guarantees that we will be able to answer them, but we'll give it a go or say we're clueless. That's absolutely fine. Um, if you find a question that you like and you want to um, say that you like it, you can vote for them as well. Okay, so you can vote for the questions and that means we just answer the ones that you most want to answer. So a little bit of a intro to today. I'll be introducing you to Mars, the red planet. And then we will be watching one of the um, videos that Derby Museums have made, especially for this event. Um, this one's about astronomer John Flamsteed. Um, now, he was the very first astronomer royal. This is the man who Greenwich Observatory was built for, and um, more of him later on. And then this is our day to have um, a little bit of time for questions and answers um so do give us loads and loads of questions for us to go at as we go through the first parts brilliant now i am going to oh i'm just going to do a little bit of fiddling here which i i should have done after i restarted my computer just in case it went a little bit um bizarre like it did on Sunday. Um, but I'll do that now. Um, and hopefully, we can get going with Mars, the red planet. I'm just wondering if any of you fancy going to Mars. Um, I should think many of us will see people walk around on Mars in the not too different, sorry, not too distant future. If that's something um, that you would be interested in, why not say so in the chat? If you think, no way, that's not for me, again, say, say so in, in the chat too. Okay, so um, I'm going to just share my screen. Oh, there we go. And of course, um, we are also introducing you a little bit to Alveston Park, which is where our star party um, originated. And um, we are not recommending that you go to the park. That's not what we want at this time. This is a case of we're bringing the park to you. So hopefully, you can see there, oh no, um, Tuesday, day of Mars. Just give me a yes in the chat if you can see Mars there. This is the Mars that was, thank you Ian, that, <laughs> that we put as part of the Science Garden in Alveston Park. This is um, 
a series of things, very diverse things. Um, strangely, for some reason, they all seem to be astronomy related um, in some way, some of them more obviously so than others. Thank you, everybody who confirmed that you can see Mars there. So, um, yeah, this is this is our planet Mars. It was um, painted by a local artist. Um, this was when it was first painted and it's um, nice and bright. We could do with repainting it, but again, it's not the sort of thing to do right now, partly because it's January and horrible and also partly because we can't really get together and do this sort of thing. Now, in Alveston Park, we have four planets. Um, they're all at scale distances from our sun mosaic with the giant pencil sticking out that some of you might have seen on Sunday. Um, the giant pencil helps us to see where the sun is from um, right over here um, at the other side of the park. And the scale that we used is that one meter in the park represents a million kilometers in space. Um, I think by now, I would hope by now, everybody's got an idea of how big two metres in, so half of that represents a million kilometres in space. So when you're doing that social distancing, make sure that you're two million kilometres away. The nearest person will be fine. <laughs> so... Um, you can see that Mars here has an ice cap, um, just like Earth has an ice cap. And just like Earth, these ice caps grow in the winter and they shrink in the summer. Now, most of that ice isn't water, though. There is some water in there that we're discovering more and more about as time goes on. But it's mostly frozen carbon dioxide. Now, if you take a deep breath and then breathe out, then you're breathing out carbon dioxide gas. If you cool that down to very low temperatures, that becomes frozen. Um, it's also called dry ice. If any of you are kind of in the performance or theater world, if you enjoy that sort of thing, sometimes dry ice is used to make those lovely foggy, misty effects. Um, that's great. So I'm just going to show you a NASA picture of the real Mars. There we go. <laughs> and then you can see that ice cap up here too. Um, down here, just here, is the largest volcano in the solar system. It's called Mount Olympus Mons. And to me, um, I just see it as kind of like a giant cow pat. It's not quite like our volcanoes at all. It is much, much spread out. And you can see, you know, this, it's not just here that the volcano extends to. You can see, you can see the edges that are stretching out around it. Now, this is evidence of volcanic activity long ago in Mars's past. Um, it's been dawned, well, it, it, it's extinct, it's, it hasn't erupted, we're not likely to see any eruptions on Mars anytime soon. So why, why did I think about Mars um, for Tuesday? It's not an obvious one, although if you think of the word for Tuesday in French, then it becomes more obvious. Well, as I mentioned in the very first um, one on Saturday, um, the days of the weeks were associated with the planets that could be seen with just your eyes um, for thousands of years. And it dates back to the Babylonians and many, many different cultures have associated therefore the days of the week with the their gods that went along with these celestial objects and um mars um for the romans was the god of war he had two horses 
um, Phobos and Deimos, those are the names of Mars's two moons. Now, I haven't got pictures of the moons. I knew there's, there's always something that I miss out. Um, but they, if you have a look at them, they're very small things. Um, they look a lot like potatoes, really. I'll try and get some pictures later on for you so you can have a look. Um, they're very, very tiny moons, but those names, Phobos and Deimos, they... Um, I always thought they meant fear and panic, but apparently it's more like terror and dread. But you get the idea. Mars had some pretty scary horses to drag him across the sky, um, bringing forward that, that sort of dread of war. But Mars had a, another side to him as well. He was the god of agriculture. Um, farming so he's associated not just with war that still doesn't explain Tuesday it does explain March but not um, Tuesday oh thanks Anthony Anthony says that about Phobos and Deimos they may be captured asteroids that's great um, yeah uh, if you've ever seen an, a picture of an asteroid that's what Phobos and Deimos look like um, our word for Tuesday comes from an uh, Anglo-Saxon god called Tu, and he's linked with the Norse god Tyr. Again, a god, a god associated with war. Um, but there's all sorts of strange stories uh, about Tyr behind the name Tuesday. One of them um, involves a wolf who, according to prophecy, was going to ki kill the king of the gods, Odin. Now, understandably, the gods didn't want this to happen. So they tried to make sure that the wolf was contained. Okay, they, they tried to keep him under a leash, but... He kept escaping, um, so the gods decided that they would try and make him a special chain, and they made it out of all sorts of weird stuff, um, bear sinew, and the sound of a cat's paw. How you make anything out of the sound of a cat's paw, I have no idea, but these are gods that we're talking about, and they forged this chain except the wolf was having none of this unless somebody would put his hand in the wolf's mouth. Now it is said that the one god who was brave or stupid enough to do this was Tyr. And he put his hand in the wolf's mouth the inevitable happened, he had his hand bitten off, but they managed to use this very, very strange chain to keep the wolf at bay. Ah, oh, strange, strange, strange story. Anyway, um, you can see Mars in the sky, Ooh, about now-ish, if you look towards the sky. One question that I'm often asked is how can you tell the difference between a star and a planet? Well, there's a fairly straightforward one that works sometimes. Um, stars tend to twinkle. Planets don't do that so much. And that's because the stars are so, so far away that we see just a point of light and that light actually has to travel through our atmosphere. And we've talked about refraction um, before in this, this is the changing in direction of light when it travels through different stuff. So that might be through a water droplet in the atmosphere, through air, changes direction ever so slightly and it will flicker on and off. Stars do this more when they're low in the horizon um, and that's because their their light has had to travel through more of the atmosphere. If you look at Sirius, 
um, at the moment. Sirius is gorgeous when it's low down on the horizon because it twinkles all sorts of different colors. Um, if you look at it for long enough, it really, really is a pretty sight. Um, planets, on the other hand, we see them as small disks. They reflect light from the sun. They don't shine on their own. Um, light from the sun goes to the surfaces. It bounces off and then back to our eyes. And what we're seeing there, although they look like points of light, are little tiny disks. So there's more um, light coming um, from those in different parts of the disk to our eyes. So if some of the um, light waves get refracted, there are other light waves that will still get through to us. Um, Brian says, we can't see anything tonight. Yeah, this is the best place to be tonight. Um, it's horrible outside. Um, if you are anywhere where you can see a star outside, just, just let us know where you are, <laughs> but it's certainly not here. Um, Peter just says, Sirius twinkling, lots of different colours and a pair of binoculars is a spe spectacular sight. Oh, that's lovely. So if, it, if you've got a pair of binoculars that need dusting off, they've been lying around the house for years. Um, not tonight, but, you know, maybe the next time that you can see stars, you could take that out and um, and have a look. Now, there's something quite special that... Um, Ian, who's I think watching today, um, hi Ian. Um, he took this picture um, with his camera. Um, I don't know whether it was yesterday or the day before. You can maybe let us know in the chat. Um, this up here is um, Mars, and this. Rowan is um, shouting out, this is Uranus, just here. Um, this is last night. Thank you, Rowan. Sorry, thank you, Ian. Um, absolutely incredible. And um, Ian was kind enough to send me this that took my breath away from Rowan. Um, Rowan, by the way, is 13 years old. He did this little diagram of how to find Uranus in the night sky. What I absolutely love about this diagram is that Mars, if we go back up to the other one, it's clearly brighter than the other um, points of light around the stars and, and the other planet. And, oh, I'll go the right way. I'll go the right way. Um, it's clearly the biggest spot on this little diagram. Uranus is much fainter. So he's actually drawn this as a... Um, much fainter dot and and all of these things either side are sized according to their brightness it made me smile so much rowan thank you if anybody wants to um find out more about rowan he actually um has his own youtube channel um it's Maybe Ian, you can remind me of 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 the name. Is Ian? Is it Rowan's Nature Channel? I remember see, watching one of them. Uh, yeah, Rowan's Nature Channel. I I watched one of the very early ones, and it, it it's pretty impressive. So thank you for that. Now this planet here, um, is quite um quite linked to Derby. And this is quite an interesting story. In a moment, I'm going to show you the video that Derby Museums have made especially for us. Thank you again. And we'll hear Spencer talking about John Flamsteed. I wanted to show you this. Okay. This is um, the house... This is one of the most amazing houses. Thank you in Morrison, I think it was for this um, one. It's one of the most amazing houses that is in the UK, as far as I'm concerned. Um, this was the house of John Flamsteed. And 
John Flamsteed at one point had the meridian, the line that divides east and west, running through his back garden. Okay. Um, if any of you have been down to Greenwich Observatory in London, that was built for John Flamsteed. And the meridian line is there. Um, you'll know if you go there, it is the safe, um, selfie spot to have one foot on in the Eastern Hemisphere, one foot in the Western Hemisphere. Well, the selfie spot in Flamsteed's time in the 1600s went right through his garden. And this is really, really cool. What would be cooler than standing um, on the Meridian Line? How about swimming over it? Because we reckon that this Meridian would have gone right through Queen Street swimming baths. Any of you from Derby will know where I mean. So some of you might have even swam over that meridian line. Well, after John Flamsteed, this house went to um, Joseph Wright, um, eventually. And Joseph Wright was, of course, the artist who painted the orrery that I introduced you to um, with Derby Museum's little video early in the week. I think we might play that again sometime because it's just beautiful and, and short. Um, after, so this is the home of one of the most famous artists of the Enlightenment era. Then it was the home of John Whitehurst. Now John Whitehurst used to go on walks in the Peak District and he would be fascinated by the layering of the rocks. Some now describe him as the father of geology. Okay, but his real job, his day job was making clocks. And he was also friends with no other than um, Benjamin Franklin, one of the founding fathers of the USA. Um, ben Franklin, he used to visit this house um his visitors on several occasions and um him and john whitehurst both together set up um what was known as the lunar society um lunar after the full moon um it sounds really weird until you realize it was an entirely practical thing um this was in a time before streetlights. So if they met once a month on, or month on full moon, um, that way they could see their way to the meeting house, which is actually in Birmingham and back. And this were, became a meeting place of, oh, scientists, industrial people, a lot of the um, people who involved in the original mills around the area would have gone there and their aim was simply to discuss the world and try and make it a better place. Um, absolutely fantastic but I'm going to stop sharing that for a moment and I'm going to share something else with you. I'm going to share the video that under incredibly difficult circumstances Derby Museums have actually put together. So this has all been made under lockdown conditions and it really is a fascinating insight into John Flamsteed. Um, you'll also see some of his um, star maps from his Atlas Celestis. Um, <laughs> Brian's saying, have we got, yeah three quarters of a million quid. If anybody happens to have three quarters of a million pounds lying behind their sofa or just wherever, please. And if we happen to have any billionaires watching, look, we know it's tough, okay? You can't put everything you've got into the economy like like we, we do because, you know, you've already got several yachts and mansions and things. We will help you out by allowing you to buy us as the people of of Derby and and beyond, buy us this. <laughs> Let other people um, tread where Benjamin Franklin tre trod. It's, it's an absolutely incredible house. Um, it is in private hands, 
Um, so sure, go buy it, do something cool with it. Um, here we go. And John Flamsteed was born in Denby in August 1646. His father, Stephen, was a local merchant. The family had briefly left Derby for Denby during an outbreak of plague, but later returned to the house they owned in Queen Street. This house was later owned by John Whitehurst, and it was the last residence of Joseph Wright. It's now commemorated by a blue plaque erected by Derby Civic Society. Flamsteed was educated at Derby Free School near St Peter's Church and seems to have taken an early interest in astronomy. A period of ill health delayed his entrance to university, but did give him time to further develop his interests. During this period, Flamsteed produced a number of observations from Derby, which would find their way into his later work. He also submitted a paper to the Royal Society based on his observations from Derby. He argued that Derby was a good place to plot a meridian because of its position near the geographical centre of Britain, and therefore a good place to base calculations. The fact that this meridian ran through Flamsteed's back garden was an added bonus. Flamsteed also acquired instruments which would assist him in his observations, a telescope, astronomical quadrant and a micrometer. In 1670, Flamsteed enrolled at Cambridge and was granted his MA by royal mandate in 1674. Following this, he was ordained as a deacon. During this period, it was not possible to earn a living as an astronomer, so it was essential that Flamsteed took on another profession. At this point, it's probably worth noting just why astronomy was increasingly important during this period. Observation of the stars and other celestial objects had been an important part of human cultures for millennia. At the time of Flamsteed's astronomical career began, the main practical purpose of astronomy was to aid navigation. By the end of the 17th century, Britain was emerging as an increasingly important maritime power, so accurate navigation was essential part of, of its political and economic interests. The ability to navigate the open seas was a main way of maintaining relationship with colonies in the Americas and the Caribbean. The growth of the transatlantic slave trade and the developing interest in the Far East were increasingly important for European economies. Navigation and by extension astronomy would play an important role in the expansion of British political and economic power over the next two centuries. As time went on, the focus of astronomy would move more away from these practical concerns and lead more towards establishing the origins of the universe. In Flamsteed's day, the practical aspects were at the forefront of the discoveries which would dominate the 17th and 18th century. Concern about how other European countries were developing their knowledge of astronomy led to the founding of the Royal Observatory at Greenwich. Flamsteed was appointed to a royal commission to look into how astronomy could be used to aid navigation. Flamsteed concluded that there wasn't enough accurate information available. In March 1675, he was appointed by war Royal Warrant as Astronomical Observatory for rectifying the tables of the motions of the heavens and the places of the fixed stars so as to find out the much desired longitude of places for the perfecting of the art of navigation. In June 1765, the Royal Observatory at Greenwich was founded on the direction of the Surveyor General of the Ordnance, Jonas Moore a mathematician and surveyor who was also a patron of John Flamsteed. The building was designed by Sir Christopher Wren and completed in the summer of 1676. Flamsteed remained astronomer royal until his death in 1719. During that time he catalogued around 3,000 stars which were published in his star catalogue, the Historia Coelestis Britannica in 1725, six years after his death. The Atlas Coelestis followed in 1729. The Historia catalogued three times as many stars as the previous star catalogues and with much greater precision. Despite his Midlands origins, Flamsteed spent much of his working life in London. Dobby Museums actually only has two objects relating to John Flamsteed. One is a portrait and the second is a copy of the Atlas Coelestis. This particular copy of the Atlas is the second edition, published in 1753. It contains 27 double page engravings, engraved and designed by James Thornhill, who also worked on Chatsworth House, St Paul's Cathedral and the Royal Hospital at Greenwich. 
The Atlas begins, O oh, render the indefatigable labours of Mr. Flamsteed as useful and beneficial to mankind as may be, as well as to complete the work already published. It has been judged very necessary by his executors to carry on and perfect the following sheets, which contain all the constellations visible in our hemisphere, wherein the ancient figures themselves are restored, and the stars laid down in their proper places with the greatest exactness from his last corrected catalogue. An important figure in John Flamsteed's life was his wife, Margaret. She not only assisted him in the observatory, but she was also the driving force behind getting his work published after his death. There had been a previous edition of his catalogue, which was produced without his permission, and which he bought up all the copies and had them destroyed. Margaret Flamsteed worked with his assistants to get his work published after his death. The publication of Flamsteed's works was an expensive endeavour and it was hampered when much of Margaret's savings were wiped out during the South Sea bubble crisis of 1720, caused by overspeculation and the collapse of the stock of the South Sea Company. Flamsteed's achievements as Astronomer Royal were significant. Although compared to our current knowledge of the universe, astronomy in Flamsteed's day may seem somewhat limited, but John Flamsteed catalogued more than three times more stars with greater accuracy than the previous best star catalogues. The size of the universe, as we now know it, would have challenged many of the assumptions of Flamsteed's day, as would the idea of an expanding universe, that the sun was just one star among many billions, or that our galaxy was just one of billions in the known universe. Another of Flamsteed's achievements was what is now known to be one of the earliest sightings of the planet Uranus. Flamsteed observed this in 1690 and thought it was a star. He catalogued it in his star catalogue as 34 Tauri because of its location in the constellation Taurus. He observed it again in 1712 and 1715. It wasn't until 1781 that the German-born astronomer William Herschel confirmed that this was a previously unknown planet. Flamsteed's life and career, from its beginnings making astronomical observations in Derby, was one of many in the course of the 17th and 18th century that expanded our knowledge of the universe. Brilliant. I, um, I hope you enjoyed that one. Um, I think it's incredible that Flamsteed, John Flamsteed, um, managed to actually note down the position of Uranus. Um, I'm just going to stop that. Just bear with me one minute. Sorry, that wasn't my intention. If you heard some weird music, um, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, um, about 100 years before the official discovery of Uranus, um, Flamsteed was there um, mapping it. Every star that you saw in those beautiful, beautiful maps um, probably represents an hour or two of maths. OK, so you can think of 3000 stars, each with an hour or two of maths, plus all the plotting and setting up and, and the illustration as well as a lot of work that went into all of those. Um, so. I think it's time for us to do our Q&A. We've had a few questions in. We've got five questions that I can see on there at the moment. I'm just going to do that. I'm just going to invite some of the astronomers um, up. Um, I know that some of you have been busy answering questions on um, with on the chat. So that's absolutely great. It's also great if you can come and talk about them too because there will be people watching on um facebook live and on um youtube as well so they won't be able to see the questions and answers so um if i repeat any questions just repeat your answers too that's great for everybody so let's let's 
invite people. Ooh. Donald, I say hi, Brian. Um, Anthony can't be with us. For some reason, we cannot get um, Anthony up here. Um, you saw him momentarily a couple of days ago. Um, he'll be answering through the chat. I will try my best to also um, say your answers too as you go through. Chris and Peter, I'm just inviting you now. Um, And is that everybody? If I if I stop there, am I missing somebody? I always tend to do that. Just just say if you if I'm missing somebody. Um, I don't think I am. We're still waiting for a couple of people to come through. Um. Cool. So I'm going to you just to have a look at the questions. I'm going to read out the top question, um, which <laughs> um, is Are there any planned missions to explore the caves on Mars? Now, Donald, you had some uh, answers on here, but you're not up here. Um, let's see if there's someone. I'll, I'll hold that question. Um, here we go. This is one's from um, Starbear. Many light years ago, I heard about an idea to seed the Martian atmosphere with cyanobacteria to introduce oxygen over a long period. Is this still a reasonable idea? I've got no idea. Um, sorry about that. Um, if anybody else does, just jump in. Um, oh, um, Anthony says he'll um, answer via, oh, oh, he says he might, he might. Well, I'll leave you some time to type, um, Anthony, and um, we'll see that. How about, this is a good one. Are you able to see Phobos and Deimos from Earth with a powerful telescope and how powerful would a telescope have to be to see them? I can't see who that's from, but... I, I don't think it, you would be able to see them from Earth because they're, they're just too small. They're, they're only tiny. Uh, you can you can see asteroids in the asteroid belt. There's a couple of, or more like dwarf planets, if you like. That, but, um, when you get very, you know, small like the, the Phobos or Deimos, I don't think you'd be able to see them from Earth. You might be able to pick them up with something like um, Edwin Hubble's 100 inch <laughs> on Mount Wilson. <laughs> okay. Um, anybody else want to add to that? Um, um, let me just say, done answering to that. I'm trying to juggle a zillion things at once, and and I'm not a multitasker. Anybody who knows me knows that I'm not a multitasker. I'm doing my best here. Um, just a quick one um, to that top question: Are there any planned missions to explore? Oh no, no, not that one. It's a cyanobacteria one. Um, so Anthony says that cyanobacteria could do the trick, as they take in carbon dioxide, they give out oxygen via photosynthesis. Thanks for that, Anthony. And it's worth remembering that right at the beginning of life on Earth, not the very beginning, but plants came first, there was a very, very thick carbon dioxide atmosphere. Plants used that and changed um, our atmosphere quite considerably to closer to what we have today. That carbon dioxide would have largely come out of volcanoes, things like that. Hope that answers. The, the whole point about um, terraforming Mars is you, you can't you can't chuck a little container of cyanobacteria on the surface and expect you know within a fortnight to have greened the planet 
it's going to take thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years. You know, to, to plan for it today, you're not planning for next week or next month or next year. You, you, you'd be planning for way, way into the future. Um, and you've got all sorts of moral problems that you're going to have to face about whether, you, whether that is a thing that we should do. Yes, okay. especially if the especially if they find um, all the life there, if you like, you know, all the bacteria, you know, you invading their their uh, the space, aren't you? Really, you know. Yeah, I um, just had a little bit of a, a, a technical comment from Ian here. Feedback echo started when our astronomer friends came online. I think one of you is a speaker's too loud and or too close to microphone um i hate to say this but chris i think i'm just going to do an experiment with you um i'm just going to um thanks donald you'll log in again that's great um i know you're having trouble with sound if there's any problems just come in um chris i'm just going to close your window and invite you back in just to see whether it is you is that okay yeah but i was on mute anyway yeah it's quite strange if somebody has something it seems to come off across on other people so i'll just try right i think can... it might be peter you think it might be peter okay well, do you think it might be me yeah i'll get chris back and we'll try peter this is how um this is how it works in science we'll change one thing at a time and hopefully we'll find out um what is causing the problem so I'm just going to say bye to you very, very briefly, Peter, and I will bring you back. Um, but whoever it is, yeah, um, there you go. If you can, I don't know, if there's any adjustment that you can do, Peter, with your um, speakers, um, it would be worth trying, is all I'm saying. We'll bring you back up in a moment. Brilliant. So, Anthony says we could end up killing the Martians that are already le there. Um, sure, if we're going to, um, if you expand on that, do you think, Anthony, um, that there are Martians up there, are there little tiny bacteria? Do you think we'll find some evidence of that or not? I know we've been looking, but... Um, Peter says try again now, I shall do that, I shall do that. It's just taking a while to load, there we go. The other, the other thing you've got, the other problem you've got with Mars is that it's, it lost its atmosphere in the first place. You know, so you've got to create some means of, of actually keeping the atmosphere there once it's, once you've redone it. It says I'm screen sharing and that looks horrible. Um, I'm not sure what happened there. Does anybody have a weird screen? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you've got my whole... Oh, no. um, I think somebody else is screen sharing. I don't think that is my screen. Whoever is screen sharing... Oh. Is Ah, there we go. There you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Don's having so. a few problems. <laughs> right, how's that? Are you getting feedback now? No. Okay. Oh, um, we are a I'll answer this for you. Um, where in Derby is John Flamsby's house? Okay, um, yeah, on the end of Queen Street. Thanks, Peter. You've already explained. I'm just going to read what you've put. It's great. Walk a buying gate past the cathedral. It's just before the traffic lights at the end of the road on the left hand side. Perfect description. Um, yeah, you can see it, from, you can just about see it from the cathedral. Um, but you just go to the end of the road there and you'll see it on the left, away from the city centre. Um, that is lovely. Unfortunately, it's, uh, there are squatters in there at the moment, and it's um, derelict. Yeah, 
it, it has been derelict. The Scottish, uh, as far as I understood, were actually doing a pretty okay job, given the circumstances, at looking after that place. Um, they did have the um, owner's permission to be there as well. So um, it's, it's a bit of a strange situation for, for that to be in, but it's, it's such an important, historically important house. It's, I would just love for people to be able to go in and have a look around and just know a little bit more about the story behind it. I'm really passionate about that house. Mm. And it's, it's incredible that somewhere like that is um it's derelict i i mean i lived in the states for a year and when i got over there um as soon as i opened my mouth and people realized i was british um they often jumped to the conclusion that i'd like old stuff and they were very very excited <laughs> about their oldest house that was 101 that year and that was absolutely amazing everybody could, could come and see it and it was you know that it was it's something that the whole community have got hold of and we're quite proud of um it was hard to keep a straight face some sometimes um coming from britain and being surrounded by old stuff sometimes we really just don't realize what we've got cool um here we go when and how can you see neptune can somebody um take on that one at all i think that's one for peter well i, I don't think neptune's not, not uh, visible to the, to the naked eye so it's it's a, it's a telescope job or it's a photographic job um probably probably photographing if, if you've got something like stellarium and you, you find out where where neptune is and uh, if you if you can photograph that part of the sky, then probably the easiest thing is to is to is to do um, I, what the chappie who discovered it um, was to if you take not not the, not Neptune um, take a photograph of the night sky and then maybe a few quite a while afterwards a week two week a month or whatever you might find that there's a, a, a slight movement Neptune's got quite a long Period, uh, orbital period, but, I mean, very, very long orbital periods. So it's not going to move very far in the night sky. But you might be able to, uh, to spot it if you, uh, if you use solarium. Find it in, in the night sky and go and have a look with either a very powerful telescope um, or take some pictures of the, of the night sky. You might be able to see it. Or pick it out anyway. That's brilliant. I've got some, a few things in the chat here. Um, Rowan here is, is saying that it is in the night sky. He says it is. Um, that's great. Um, I think that's what it, it, it relates to. I don't know. Anthony's saying, let me check. So we'll, we'll wait, wait for him. Um, another one for Anthony. There could quite possibly be um, either Martian microfossils or viable Martian bacteria in the soil. Um, Let's go down and have a look. Um, how was Neptune discovered? Does anybody want to take on that one? Here's one for... It was... Um, um, I can't remember his first name. A guy called Verrier, was it? Or, uh, Le Verrier. Le, that's right. Le Verrier. He, he was a mathematician. And he um, noticed that there was something wrong with the orbit of Uranus. Uh, and he predicted the position of Neptune. Uh, and within a couple of, a, a few weeks, uh, I can't remember the guy's name now, it was a German astronomer, actually discovered Neptune in the right place where Le Verrier had, had said it should be. But at the same time, there was an English astronomer who did the same. Anthony will probably know these names because he's good with names. I can't remember my grandchildren's names. <laughs> Can you remember, the, Anthony? The Wikipedia web page is a Johann Gottfried Galley. Galley, that's him. Yeah. That's the, 
Yes, yeah, so he was a German astronomer who, who looked where uh, Le Verrier had said it would be. But at the same time, there was an English astronomer and there was a lot of arguments as to who actually discovered it first. Couch Adams, John Couch Adams. Thank you, Anthony. He, he discovered it at about, about the same time and there was a lot of arguments. Brilliant. Okay. Um, <laughs> there's a good question here. Um, it's is there ever going to be? Sorry, I just clicked so much stuff on there. I don't know quite what's happened. Um, I need to just go to people. But is there any plan to have a Mars rover mission to? Um, Mount Olympus Mons. Um, can I just ask one of you just to talk a little bit about the difficulty of control? We have had Mars rovers. The difficulty of controlling a Mars rover um, from here on Earth because there's a massive delay, isn't there? It's seven minutes, isn't it? The the the, uh, the time a, a signal takes to get to Mars, or oh, fifteen minutes. Well, seven there and back. <coughs> It, it, the difficulty is it's like having a conversation with somebody and not getting, you know, asking a question and not getting a reply for, let's, let's say, half an hour, and then, then you reply to that, what they've said, and they have to wait half an hour to get a reply. So if, if, if you've got a Mars rover coming to the edge of a, of a precipice or some steep decline, and you say, stop! <laughs> <laughs> it's quite... It's quite difficult to, so <clears throat> you really, you really need to have a planned, I think a planned mission to know the terrain somewhat beforehand. Uh, with the uh, orbiters that are going around Mars, there are some spectacular, uh, I think, I think in 3D, if I'm, if I'm right there. So you, there are quite some very, very good um, maps of the Martian surface. So in a way, you, like, like using um, GTS on the Earth. You could, you could almost plan a route um, independent, if you like, of, uh, of commands from the Earth. That I, I, that I would imagine that would be technically possible, but difficult to do. But you, you certainly need some control over your rover. But as, as Brian says, a time delay introduces all sorts of problems. So you need, you need some kind of um, artificial intelligence as well built into the rover to recognize that there are um, either crevasses or big boulders, or which obviously you can see, but um, you know, anything that's likely to cause a problem, and it can take evasive action on its own, that it's been programmed to do it. That's brilliant. Um, we just had a little bit from Anthony here. He says 15 minutes delay, so to get a command sequence sent, it takes around 30 minutes. Yeah. Um, he says it's a bit like answering questions via chat. <laughs> Sorry, Andy, we're not trying here. <laughs> yeah, Katie, it's Chris here. Just a, a, another aspect that struck me. Um, last year on Sky, there was a series of documentaries about the Apollo missions. Um, and it's one of the few things on Sky that's worth, worth, worth watching. Sky the television, I mean, not Sky the Sky. Um, and it was interesting that the the uh, not only is it guiding the system around, it was that, that and there was a push against it. There was a, a, a I can't remember the guy's name. There was a, a, a geologist who said that the 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 people who went onto the moon should be taught about geology so that they can look at the environment, look at the types of rocks, and, and take really sensible samples rather than just picking up the odd rock here and there. And looking at the different types and so on and, and of course you know that's always the argument for sending people rather than robots because you you can do that sort of thing so that was quite a fascinating insight into how you decide what to do because it's not just picking up a bit of dust and sending it back or or analyzing it it's sorting it out and you know artificial intelligence might do it one day but i don't think it can well, at the moment I, I, I don't know i mean i'm playing devil's advocate at this point okay um artificial intelligence you could you can is getting very, very, very clever. 
uh, you can train artificial <laughs> intelligence. You can, you can program um, so that the, you can actually look at the terrain, look at the geology of the terrain. And given that we now know, think that uh, Mars was, was once covered in water, the water flowed, it's got uh, a different, a sim similar kind of um, bedding and layering of rocks uh, to, to, be, to that we've got on, on Earth. You can recognize uh, layering, you can recognize sedimentary uh, rocks. Um, and I, and I, I would imagine it would be fairly straightforward to train um, a rover, or the artificial intelligence guiding the rover around, to recognize these features probably as good as, or if not better, than um, a human explorer. And to just you know, go and pick these up and, and analyze them and send the data back to Earth. It would be far cheaper to do that than it would be to send people to Mars. And I, I really can't see us sending people to Mars for a long, long time. Um, I'm just looking in the chat um, here. Um, yeah, Anthony's trying to do a shout out for geologists. I will also shout out for geologists too. Anthony says, I think. But the first crew on Mars, if, if people do actually go, must have a um, geologist on, on board. As somebody who studied geology for a year at university level, I, for various reasons, I started off doing a physics degree, changed to geology, and then came back to complete my astrophysics. Um, my project, I tried to link the two by looking at the uh, moons of Jupiter. Um, geology is not quite the right word, word but... Um, the information that you can get, um, even from my very, very basic geology, um, is, is absolutely incredible. And, and I do agree that, I agree with both of you, first of all, it is really dangerous, but hey, humans do dangerous stuff just because they can. I mean, we climb mountains, we go into space in the first place. I think people will go to Mars because of the challenge of it. Um, I do agree that it's safer, but I also agree that a geologist on Mars would give out a really, really um, good, very useful um, view of the terrain to give a lot more information about where to set up things um, as well. I've also had something coming in that I want to mention um ian russell has just said um just um put a link if you go up and chat a little bit he says just google and rowan is right about galileo having seen and recorded neptune without realizing it was a planet i'll, I'll look at that link um and anthony says just tell me when and i'll get my hammer i think he's quite keen to go to mars with his hammer <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> I think if we if we do decide to send people to Mars, if it does go ahead, and I would agree that the crew should be, you know, <laughs> the scientists, geologists, and people who can actually, you know, look at the terrain and understand the terrain. It's the question of whether we want to send people there. But if we do send people, then I think we've got to be careful about who we send and that they are they're properly trained and like you know. I mean, if, if you could guarantee a safe return, 100% guarantee, I, w I wouldn't mind a trip to Mars. It's just, it's just getting there and coming back. <laughs> I think there's a lot to understand before we go anywhere. Absolutely, really. Brian. There's a lot. Absolutely. And this is where Martin Braddock's talk came in useful, wasn't it? Because he talks about all the various things that we have to consider um before we can go out into space yeah, yeah. you yeah. know martin, martin yeah. braddock by the way for those you know that aren't with us uh he's a, a speaker that we've had from um yeah sherwood uh, observatory and, and the uh i can't remember the the uh, society is with but he's a, he's a speaker that we've had and he's, he's actually um a doctor he, he, he works with medicines and the and the uh, 
development of them. So he, he, he knows what he's talking about when it comes to, you know, space science and things like that. And his talks are really, really good. Oh, yeah. I mean, from, from our point, I wasn't advocating actually sending people as opposed to robots when I made my statement. I, I was just saying what the difficulty is, is when you've got to send something there and in effect, if it's 15 minute round trip for a radio signal, you've got to let it virtually go off and do its own thing pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if, you, if you want a good read, um, the Martian, um, in a, the, and they made a film of the book. I can't, I can't remember the, the author of the book, but The Martian um, is actually a, quite a good read. It's a good yarn. Um, I, I, you know, and, and having been abandoned on the Martian surface, a million and one things have got to go right in order to get him back off the Martian surface. And a million and one things do go right. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's a story um, that it's an, it would have been an impossible task. It's a good yarn, it's a good film. Um, yeah, I've seen it. It is, yeah. It's an interesting story, very interesting story, because it does, you know, it does touch on all those things that you're going to have to consider to, to live or, or even to get there and, and to stay on the Martian <laughs> yeah. But you can take it with a pinch of salt, but it's a, it's a good yarn. Yeah, it's just thinking of all the different things. Um, I know psychology is going to be a big part of any extended space mission at all because people have got to live in a confined space for a long time. And that's not easy. I mean, people are struggling at the moment, um, <laughs> living with their family 24-7 in lockdown. And you know these people really, really well. And whoever you are and however well you get on, it still isn't easy and here you've got you can't just say oh i'm just going to the spare room and just walk out of the door and have a walk around the block when you're in a spacecraft um you've got to choose the right people who and the right team who can interact with each other like that and the physiology as well i mean if you break an arm up in space you know who's going to fix it that's got to be fixed um by somebody um you can't you can't bounce yeah. off in a, in a fit of peak and slam the door <laughs> Absolutely. The you can't even go on your computer and do a bit of amazon retail therapy either just a little one i kept out that um little link and yeah um Rowan said here, 28th of December, 1612, Galileo saw Neptune near Jupiter and recorded it. That is absolutely incredible. Galileo was one of the first people to use a telescope. Um, I'll be talking about him a little tomorrow when I do quiet eyes and aliens because the moons I'll be talking about are called the Galileo moons because Galileo was the first to see them. Um, the key to grabbing a um planet discovery though is to track its movement over a number of days or weeks the word planet goes back to the greek word meaning wanderer and these will move against the backdrop of stars and um i think these little things are really really interesting because they bring up this um question of discovery we're quite keen to have our um, discovery heroes, if we like, but often it's a team of people behind it, or often people see something and realize it's there but don't understand what it is. And getting to the point where not only have you observed it, but you know what it is, and you can say what that is, and you can convince the right people to accept what you are saying at the time, that's what goes into a discovery. Um, uh, least in our world sense of it but yeah these things it was really really interesting um ian's just put in the nature article i shared as a quote from it we found that galileo observed the planet neptune the 28th of december 1612 and the 28th of january 1613. the latter observation may be of astrometric value and differs by one arc minute from the predicted position of neptune um, Galileo also detected the motion of Neptune. So he was actually doing that. That's, that's absolutely incredible. That's a lovely thing 
that about this sort of thing i'm just learning new stuff all of the time now there's something in there that i'm going to hand over to the astronomers to answer because i realize i'm rabbiting on quite a lot um can one of you explain what an arc minute is well if you look on a clock if you look at a clock face if, and you look at a second hand as the second hand is going round, it goes round 60 times okay that's for one minute now if you take each one of those ticks is six degrees on a circle so six degrees if you divide a that that six degrees that one tick by six you've got one minute yeah oh sorry one degree then you divide that by 60 that gives you one arc minute and then you divide it by 60 again to get one arc second so it's an incredibly small um, measurement you know to, to say that in 1612 Galileo was doing this you know measuring it with, with the instruments that they had in 1612 is incredible it's one, uh, three, one three thousand six hundredth of a degree one arc second okay one a bit strange there from my point of view i'm not sure whether that's the crowd crest thing uh, uh, to give to my view or, or not but um thanks i think we've, we've got what you were saying there it's really really tiny i've got a good question here um this is this is for you lot. if life is found on mars before the first manned mission do you believe it's ethical for us to continue our plans to send humans there no Brian shaking his head and saying no. Anthony shouting no. <laughs> um, I know it's something that's come up as a an issue with um, a plan to smash some spacecraft into the um, surface of Europa. Um, the worry is, I mean, it's it's viruses. They can you, you can sterilize to a certain extent, but there's stuff hanging around in our atmosphere and viruses have been shown to be able to survive in space so we've, we've you got know. this sort of in, international agreement haven't we that we won't land landers on on the moons of jupiter and uh, um, other moons around in the solar system there's sort of an agreement there but it's a, we're a bit hypocritical because we we're still talking about sending people to Mars um, so the same should apply and yes if, if we do find life on Mars then it would be morally wrong to go there and, and you know, take any of any bugs or whatever that we, we've got so I think an interesting um, thing about this you know you know you may have heard that uh, phosphine has been discovered in the atmosphere of Venus and one of the um, what, what is what is suspected is the the phosphine one of its um its origins is it's um a product of life now it, it might be purely natural uh but the, we don't know um and if it's a product of life then that life form um may you know, if we went went close to venus with with uh, satellites get picked up or whatever and brought back to the earth so there's there's, there's a problem both ways isn't it us going to planets and, and places where life may exist and however primitive i use the word primitive um, very loosely um, and i'm working the other way that um uh, you know that it's theoretically possible for the solar wind to pick up life from venus if it's floating around the atmosphere and bring it to earth yeah it's i think there's some really difficult questions that difficult, yeah. got to answer i'm um, here i've got a technical one um i'm hoping that if one of you will um answer this um why do a lot of the time use photo stacking instead of taking one simple photograph of what things actually look like so 
sorry, um, Katie, what was the question again? It was, why do a lot of astronomers use photo stacking instead of taking one simple photograph of what things actually look like? Um, I think why, this is... Go on. Why do they stack pictures instead of just taking one? Yes. <clears throat> um, well, there's, there's a couple of reasons why. Um, one, one is you, you're effectively adding together all the light that you're getting from each individual picture. So you, you're actually getting a far better image by, by collecting lots of separate images. And you could, you could take one, let's say, you could take one hour long image, um, but it's, it's actually better if you take, say, 60 one minute images. Um, and the other reason is that each of your images will have some noise associated with it. And if you stack images, then the noise adds randomly, whereas the light adds cumulatively. So your what's called the signal to noise ratio is, uh, gets better and better and better. The more images you take, you actually end up with a far better quality image. Okay, um, just a little bit of chatter in the um, chat. Um, Rowan said, photo stacking stops us knowing what we will actually see if we look at something. Um, Anthony's replied with much of what you've said, Peter. Um, you get a better resolution and definition of the image. And he also says stacking actually brings out the image's true nature. I think it's a nice way of looking at it. Um, well, what is an interesting uh, philosophical question? Uh, uh, what is the true nature of the object? Um, Rowan's actually come back to the, back on that. It's, he says it may be rest of resolution, but a lot of people, including you, would like to know what different space objects look like, so we know what to look for through a telescope. And I think um, Stellarium really helps with that, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Brian uh, alluded to this thing on. Um, on the first session, looking at Stellarium and looking at out in, in the night sky with the eye and then with the binoculars and telescope. Um, and because Hubble has spoiled us with lots and lots of beautiful images, that's not what you see. You, as Brian pointed out, you see smudges or you see faint glows. Um, and it's only when you take um, high resolution and long exposures, you, you, you begin to see colours. And sometimes, obviously, um, Hubble, for instance, uses artificial colours. It's not cheating. I mean, they're beautiful images, but it, it's, it's, they're scientific and artistic. So it uses colours to enhance the images and, and to highlight um, you know, different elements, chemicals, um, and different things that, that you want, want to, are looking for. Um. Rowan's put here, I think there's more beauty of seeing the actual thing than looking at a high definition picture. Okay, um, we had a discussion before all of this started, which I think was quite nice. We, we kind of agreed between that everybody should see two things in their lifetime and possibly do that through a telescope. And those two things were the moon and Saturn. And I think there is something to be said for just looking through a simple refractor or reflecting telescope and just seeing that as it was. Of course, um, if you're looking through any telescope, you're looking at a modified image. That image is modified by, by the equipment that you're looking through. So, um, yeah, looking at a clear night sky with just your eyes is also breathtaking. I, I get that, um, but I also get that the technology that we have allows us to see more in more detail and of course things that are invisible to us. I'm sure the Health and District Astronomical Society are going to go into way more detail than this, but if you imagine a rainbow, okay, you've got the red at the top and you've got the violet below, well there's still stuff above that red, that's infrared, that's what we feel from the sun. Um, Above that, we've got radio waves. We just 
don't have the equipment, our eyes are the equipment we have for detecting this stuff in our skin to a certain extent for the infrared. We don't have detectors for radio waves. We don't have detectors for um, x-rays and gamma rays in our bodies, but we can build stuff. And this actually opens up our view to so much more of the universe. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Um, I think we, um, I'm going to ask this question because it's been hanging around for, for a while. This is from Kay. What is, I, I, I don't know if any of you all know this, what is a suspected geological explanation for the formation of the strange stone circle spotted on Mars, dubbed Mars Henge? I don't know anything about Mars Henge. Anybody else know anything about Mars Henge? Um, Anthony's just said there isn't. <laughs> Anthony's got geology background. I, I, I take that on board. <laughs> Thanks, one of, one of, one, Sorry to hold this. One, one of the problems um, of being human is that we have this enormous propensity to see patterns uh, out there in nature. Sometimes when they're not there, um, and we have, one of, one of the, uh, the pattern-making bits of our brain wants to see faces everywhere where there are not faces. And that's, when you look up at the clouds, you know, the game we've all played is, what can you see in the clouds? What sort of animals? What sort of faces? You see them everywhere. And there are some geological features on Mars that some people claim, oh, I've seen a face in the rocks on Mars. Because as humans, our brains are programmed and faces and patterns and this um, Mars, uh, Mars Henge uh, on Mars is another example where we see patterns. There's a collection of rocks strewn on the surface and you immediately, because you know about Stonehenge, you immediately see the pattern and where a pattern may not exist and it might be a random collection of rocks on the surface of Mars. I'm probably I'm just going to add to that because I spoke about this as a word that I forgot, but I was just struggling around because I knew I wrote, wrote it down because I'd forget it. It's called pareidolia. Um, and this is how we get the man in the moon. People look at the moon and see pictures of it. And that's where the whole giant moon rabbit um, idea comes in. And that's that that's gone cross cultural. Um, it's very popular in the Far East, but it goes. Aztecs had saw a rabbit in the moon, um, as did Native American cultures. Um, and it comes from the game that, as you said, Peter, that we've all played of looking up at the clouds and seeing pictures. Our brains are set up, pictures, story, songs. This is what we're primed for. Um, Anthony says, yep, pattern recognition. Um, <laughs> Um, not aliens, ladies and gents. I'm going backwards through your um, <laughs> comments, actually, <laughs> just, to, just to confuse matters. Basically, it's a group of objects, rocks that have been weathered into the forms seen. Hope that helps, Kay. Um, I'm going to do one last question because I think we're going to have to wrap up here sometime soon. I'm just looking. Please forgive me if I um, miss out your questions. There will be time to ask questions at the end of every session I think um, there'll be somebody around I'll be around um, I'm going to go for this one how would someone be able to realize that Uranus's orbit was wrong when it's so far away um, sorry this is, this is um, illustrates the beauty of physics uh, and mathematics, because um, um, I'll mention Kepler. Kepler, Kepler realized that the orbits of the planets were, were elliptical, and, 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 and elliptical orbits obey certain rules. You can work out where something is going to be. Um, and I think calculations were done um, on, the, on the orbit of Uranus, and so it, they thought, well, it's going to be at such and such a place because it obeys Kepler's laws at a certain time, and um, and, and Newton's Newton's laws as well. 
and they discovered that it wasn't it wasn't where it should have been. Um, and because it wasn't where it should have been, the reasoning went that something must have perturbed it. There must be some other object which is influencing it. So it's, it's basically understanding the laws of physics and how the solar system works, realizing that there's a problem, not with the physics, but there must be something influencing the movement for it not to be where you expect it. And they thought, well, if that's the case, if there's an object out there further out, perhaps where it now is can be accounted for the next planet out being at this position. And lo and behold, you went and looked in that position. Bingo. I mean, that just shows you how beautiful math and physics is to work out at such a distance and find a planet. Yeah. Um Absolutely, I'm just going to read what Anthony's put as well. Um, when Uranus was observed for long enough, it was realized that it was wobbling along its orbital path as if something was pulling on it. That gave us the first clue that there may be a body um, beyond Uranus, hence the hunt for Neptune. One final one, because Donald, I think this is one for you if you're okay. Um, uh, you've already answered this, but um, I think we should say it as a, a thing. Are you able to see Triton with a powerful home telescope? Peter. You can, <laughs> uh, but but you need something about uh, about 10 inch wide telescope to be able to gather enough photons from it. And you also need exceptionally good viewing conditions. So that's great atmospherics and uh, uh, Titan being in exactly the right position to be able to observe it, that it's illuminated enough. It's, I think it's only about a 13 power uh, object, so it's, uh, it's, it's quite faint, but I have seen it. Um, Rose has got, how, how expensive is a 10 inch telescope? Yeah. Say again, please. How expensive is a 10 inch telescope? I'm not about to set you back. Oh, if you look behind me, there's a couple of telescopes. One is hidden in the corner, and that's a 10-inch Dobsonian telescope. And I, I purchased that for about £250. But that's a large collecting telescope. The second one you can see, which is a refracting telescope, a very long tube, is uh, much more expensive. Uh, you would need to discuss that with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> because Don hasn't. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, well, thanks everybody. I'm just going to um, say bye to you all um, one by one. I'll just give you a heads up of what's going um on next do come back there'll be chance to ask loads more questions in future ones but i'm just aware of the time thank you very much to everybody all of Darwin district astronomical society who have spent their time coming here answering questions um, it's been absolutely fantastic um i'll see you um bye chris um brian thank you bye peter bye donald and finally, I'll just give you a um, update of what we're going to do. Please come along. Tomorrow, I'm going to be putting out the pinwheel craft and I will be talking about um, what constellations actually are. Um, I say, let's do that at midday. You'll be able to watch a replay if you forget, but that will be a nice thing to do at um, midday tomorrow. It, if there's a delay, I'll be be because I'm stuck at the dentist um, but hopefully that will all be over by then and I'll play that video that I messed up earlier in the week. Um, this is a craft activity from Derby Museum and Art Gallery. Um, they've created this for us. I have a go at making it. If you want to print it out and have a go yourselves, um, you can go to alvestonparkfriends.org.uk. It's up there. It's also on um where am i trying to say it's on derby museum's website as well rowan don't worry um if you've got school 
Um, everything's up and available on YouTube afterwards so you can watch the replay. Any questions you have about doing that, just ask me um, at 6 p.m. tomorrow. Um, I'll be there too. So tomorrow evening at 6 p.m., I'm going to be talking about Mercury and then fire, ice and aliens. That's my little tour around the Galilean moons of Jupiter. Uh, on Thursday, more of Jupiter and then telescope and binoculars, a chat with the astronomers from DDAS there. Friday is Venus Day. Um, and then we've got me again doing the Stardust life cycle of stars. So I'll be squishing in. Um, several billion years into into about 20 25 minutes um saturday is day of saturn um saturn um if uh, we've already had some sort of um baking going on we've had moons shortbread moons we've had stars um if you've got any baking stuff if you're baking something solar system ish Post your pictures on um, Facebook on Alveston Park Friends and we'll see whether we can share them. Um, uh, because Saturn was the god associated with um, feasting and frivolity. So, so yeah, you can do that. Um, but we've also got the hidden light from Derby District Astronomical Society. They're going to come and talk about infrared astronomy and the James Webb Telescope later this year. If you can't wait, Again, go on to um, alvestonparkfriends.org.uk. Um, Judy has been fantastic, um, as has Donald for sending this. There is a model of the James Webb Telescope that you can print out and build at home. Okay, so if you do that, if you try any of our models, um, you know, again, it would be nice for you to take a picture and, and send it to us, that, that is cool. Um, and finally, we have the wonderful award-winning Ian Russell coming to us on Sunday to guide us through um, the huge, huge distances involved in space. We'll be adding more to our Sunday program as well as that. Um, if you want, if there's anything you particularly want us to add to that, then let us know, and we can we can get something together because this is your event. We're doing it because you come and see it, so we're open to ideas for that. Um, yeah, Donald says A4 printer on on thin card is what you need to do to make the James Webb telescope. There's all sorts of other models there if you if you want to make something different too. Um, when are we doing Uranus and Neptune? Um, we're saving those. Okay, we're saving those maybe for next year. We we haven't we haven't got anything in there. Do you think we should have something in there, Rowan? Maybe we we squeeze Uranus and Neptune in. Okay, we'll we'll squeeze that in. I think probably on the Sunday. They're the best planets, yeah. Um they're, they're always the forgotten ones, um, I think. Um I remember going to a planetarium show at Jodrell Bank when I was a child and they had these little boaty things and you could vote for your planet. I always wanted to go to those two planets. If I was sitting by an empty seat, I'd, I'd grab theirs and vote, try and vote twice. <laughs> and I never got there. I got to Neptune once. I couldn't go to Uranus. Um, but yeah, I'm with you. Okay, we've got something that we'll, we'll put into that one on, on Sunday. Please come back. Please tell your friends. Please share this wide um, because um, the further we can get, the better. We've put so much effort into getting this up for you. It's great that you're involved. Um, and, yeah, don't feel afraid to just say hi in the chat before the event as well. I, I look on um, every now and then beforehand. I got scared today because there were zero people <laughs> right up to 10 minutes before um and I, I i was i was a little concerned that nobody would turn up um i worry about that before I, every stargazing we do but yeah um come say hi it makes us feel better and i'll see you tomorrow at some point anthony said mercury often gets overlooked well i'm not overlooking mercury i'm going to do mercury tomorrow so come back then um <laughs> I'll see you soon. Um, come back tomorrow and do please share with all your friends. That's brilliant. Bye.